Hi everyone, this is Germinal Van, founder of the GGV Publishing Podcast. Today we are going to talk about whether voting is a right or a privilege. As I said in the previous episode, when I talk about democracy and the illusion of freedom, I said at the end of that episode that I was going to address voting specifically, uh, the, the issue of voting or, on whether it's a right or a privilege. And that's what we're going to talk about in this episode today. So it's, it's important to understand that in many liberal democracies, voting is considered a sacred right. And at each election cycle, politicians use the following sentence. Go out and vote. You must vote. This is the most important election in our lifetime. If you do not vote, the country is doomed. Every single election, politicians retort the same phrase over and over and over. And especially American politicians, right? But I think it's not just limited to the United States. I think it's pretty much politicians in other liberal democracies, such as uh, the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Chile, Australia, Italy, Japan, etc. I think all the politicians in all these countries pretty much use the same rhetoric. But that begs two questions in my mind, right? The first question is, is voting actually a right or a privilege? And the second question is, who benefits from voting? Because we love to tell people to get out and vote, but we have we all have incentives. And who gets what when they vote? So I'm going to start first with whether voting is a right or a privilege. So as I aforementioned, right, the act of voting is considered a right. In some liberal democracies, such as the United States, it is even considered a fundamental right. But has voting always been a fundamental right? The connotation of calling the right to vote a fundamental right, I believe, is utterly misleading. A fundamental right is a negative right. And negative rights are liberties that protect people from interference. That being said, they create negative obligations on others to refrain from certain actions. For example... The right to life is a negative right because no one has the right to take someone else's life. The right of speech is another negative right wherein the government cannot arrest you for your opinions, at least in theory. The right to privacy is also a negative right wherein others cannot spy on you without your consent. The list could go on, but if you look at the U.S. Constitution, the 10 First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution are essentially negative rights. And the right to vote was not enumerated among these rights. This then settles the point that voting is not a fundamental right. Now we know that voting is not a fundamental right. But does it mean that it is still a right? That leads me to now address the point of positive rights. So a positive right is a right that requires others to provide you with something such as resources, services, or opportunities. They create positive obligations on others to take certain actions. For example, the claim that uh, the right, so the claim of the right to an education, the right to healthcare, or the right to a decent standard of living are all positive rights because they are granted to people by central authority. And the right to vote also falls under that category, a positive right. The later amendments that were added to the U.S. Constitution were all positive rights because they were granted by government. The key feature to understand about positive rights is that they are conditional rights. Think about it like loans, right? So when we say the conditional right, that means that they come with conditions. And that's why I say think about a loan because a loan is the same way. So a loan is granted to the borrower under certain conditions that must be met, right? So if the borrower does not meet this condition, he could either be denied the loan or if granted the loan, the loan could be called off if the borrower failed to make payments. 
it is the same for positive rights. But in the case of positive rights, the loan is the right itself, the government is the lender, and the borrower is the citizen. And the government gets to decide the terms and conditions under which it grants that right to the citizens. For example, the right to vote was not a right until Andrew Jackson expanded universal suffrage to white men over 21 years of age in the 1820s. Here, the condition was that in order to vote, one must be white, must be a man, and must be older, must be 21 years old or older than 21 years old. Women, blacks, and other social and ethnic groups were not allowed to vote. Before Andrew Jackson expanded universal suffrage to white men of all social classes, voting was exclusively a privilege reserved for a selected few. Before the 1820s, voting was a political activity reserved to asset owners and educated citizens. And the rationale behind that voting structure was that asset owners have a stake in the economy and therefore understand what, what was at risk. And educated people possess the intellectual ability and knowledge to understand the implications of the policies being implemented. And the right to vote was then expanded further to blacks through the 15th, the 15th Amendment and then to women under the 19th Amendment. The 26th Amendment was then added to the Constitution to lower the voting age. If voting was then an inherent right, then this amendment would not have been added to the Constitution in the first place. That means that everyone, regardless of race, ethnicity, gender, or age, would be simply voting. It wouldn't matter because it's something that is bestowed upon you from the day you were born. But with voting is not the case. If the essence of a right is an entitlement that is de facto bestowed upon an individual on the premise that it cannot be taken away, such as the right to life, then positive rights are not rights but privileges because they require a set of conditions to be met in order to receive such entitlement. Therefore, the so-called right to vote is consequently not a right but a privilege since Voting is a conditioned political and civic activity that is granted to people under certain requirements. True freedom is absolute. It's not conditional. At least we can agree on that. That being said, the right to vote is not a right and it does not assert freedom. Now that we settle the question of whether the right to vote by, or whether the right to vote is actually a right or a privilege, now we know that it's a privilege. It's important to answer the next question, which is, who benefits from voting? As I said, politicians keep pushing people to vote, but who benefits from voting? Charlie Munger, the former billionaire investor and vice chairman of Berkshire Hathaway, may so rest in peace, once famously said, show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. Who does voting benefit, right? In order to understand that, you need to understand the incentive of the people who are saying you must go to the polls and cast your vote. Because someone who tells you to go vote will not tell you that just for the sake of telling you that. There is an incentive because there's an outcome that the person telling you to go vote wants to, to reach. Right? And in a liberal democracy, voting benefits two groups of people. The political class and the low-income groups. The major loser is the productive taxpayer. Let, let me explain what I mean. What voting does, especially in a liberal democracy like the US, uh, like the United States system, is that it ascertains the tragedy of the commons. For those who never heard of that term, the, the, the tragedy of the commons refers to a situation in which Individuals with access to public resources have no incentive to maintain that resource, at least the value of that resource, and everyone is then worse off than they had been. The political class massively benefits from voting because it grants them 
the legitimacy to enforce arbitrary laws and policies on people and they would not enforce those arbitrary laws and policies on themselves. Members of the political class have privileges that the voters themselves do not have such as immunity, life pensions, privileges from arrest, and etc. Voting in a liberal democracy empowers government, for example, to arbitrarily determine tax rates for each income bracket without asking if this is what the voters in each income bracket actually want. I highly doubt that voters who make $400,000 a year would willingly want to be taxed almost half of their income, right? And the second group, as I said, is the low income class. They benefit massively from voting because they get to access public resources without any incentive to maintain the value of these resources. The connection between the political class and the low income class is that the political class enforces policies that incentivize an involuntary distribution of wealth, where the political class forcefully taxes high income payers, uh, taxpayers, or nationalized businesses in order to transfer that wealth in the form of social programs to low income classes. And the members of the low income classes get to enjoy these resources without having to participate in their creation in the first place or even attempting to maintain their value. This is why liberal democracies are essentially welfare states. And the real problem of the so-called or the so-called right to vote, it's, it's that it creates the free rider problem where people benefit from resources, goods and services without having to pay for them. For the political class in a liberal democracy, voting is the cornerstone of its survival. Those politicians advertise democracy as this false gospel of freedom to increase their electoral base. The more voters they are, the more powerful becomes the political class, and the more disincentivized the low-income class would be to become productive, while the productive taxpayers continue to pay for those who use those resources without having to pay for them. So you see that voting, in fact, doesn't really do anything for you. If you're poor, sure, if you vote, you're going to get uh, welfare programs and you, you just get kinds and you're fine. Fine in the sense that you get to do things without having to pay for it. But for the productive taxpayer, that is a challenge. So I hope that helps you guys understand why I think that voting is a privilege and not a right. And it's a privilege that should be earned, in my opinion. And I think they're like, uh, I believe John Stuart Mill wrote a book called Considerations for a Representative Government, where he explained the conditions under which people should be granted the uh, the right to vote so i hope you guys enjoyed this episode and i'll see you guys next time mm -hmm.